Hello. In this video, we're going to learn how to create sprite-based games using JavaFX. To begin with, I've got a basic core template style class. As usual, I'm extending the application class. Uh, public static void main looks the same as always. Uh, we're going to launch the application, catch any exceptions, and finally exit when we're done. In this game, uh, we're going to do one of the simpler games, which can be made. In this game, you're going to control a character that moves around the screen with the arrow keys, and it's going to try to collect various objects, earning points along the way, and once all the objects are collected, the player wins the game. I like to think of this as the hello world of video game development. All right, in the application class, every application has to have a start method, which takes a stage as a parameter. I'm going to go ahead and set the title of the stage. I'll give it the name of this game, which I like to call Starfish Collector. It's my main layout manager. I like to use the border pane. It's really useful if you have some kind of a menu bar across the top. However, in this case, we're really only going to use a canvas element in the central area. Uh, once we've chosen our pane, we're going to attach that to a scene, then we'll attach the scene to a stage, and then we'll write some customized code. All right, to start off, let's go ahead and create a canvas. A canvas called Canvas. That will be a new canvas, and let's make it perhaps 600 by 600 pixels to start. I also need a graphics context object that performs all the drawing operations on the canvas. And we can actually get that from the canvas object. We'll want to, of course, add the canvas to the border pane so it actually displays in the scene. So let's say root.setCenter to be the canvas. Let's also start off by creating a blue background. Let's say context dot set the fill color to be, just do a straight up blue for now. And then context, let's draw a filled in rectangle, starting in the upper corner, filling out the entire screen. All right, and once this is done, of course, we have to show the stage to get anything to display on the screen. Let's test this out by compiling. And let's run the main method. Sure enough, we have a nice blue screen. That's the first step. All right, in game development, we're gonna want to move objects around the scene, which are called sprites. So we'll set up a separate class for that kind of object. And the sprites in a video game, they usually have a couple of pieces of information associated with them, including position, perhaps some kind of velocity for movement, some image data, which is rendered to the screen, and to determine when two objects overlap, some kind of collision polygon, usually a rectangle. So I'm going to create a few simple helper classes to get us started. Uh, first, I'll create a class called, well, let's call this class point, or maybe vector. This is going to be a simple class, nothing really to do with JavaFX here. Say public class uh, vector, this will be a 2D vector. Right, this will contain a public double X and a public double Y. And then let's set up a public vector, the constructor, which will take in X and Y, and then set the parameters. All right, very good. So a very simple class just to store X and Y data for us. That'll be convenient. Let's also create a rectangle class. We'll represent the boundary of each object as a rectangle. It's not perfect, but for our first pass, this will be fine. A public class rectangle. 
A rectangle is usually defined by four values. First, the x and y coordinates of one of the corners. We'll usually use the top left corner. And also, we'd like to store the width and the height of the rectangle. Right here, let's create a constructor. Which will take in x, y, width and height. We'll set all those values. All right, and the main thing we want to do with a rectangle is determine if two rectangles overlap. And this is actually a pretty straightforward function to write, so we'll go ahead and write it. Uh, it's gonna return a Boolean. We'll say it overlaps. We're gonna check if it overlaps a different rectangle. All right. So we're going to use something here called the separating axis theorem to check if two rectangles overlap. It's actually a pretty easy concept to wrap your mind around. Uh, two rectangles, first, instead of asking when they overlap, let's figure out when two rectangles do not overlap. And to help us understand that, I've got a picture over here. And so here I've got two rectangles, a red rectangle on the left and a blue rectangle on the right. And you might notice that they do not overlap. This green dashed line in the middle would be an example of something called a separating axis. And the idea is, in this case, because the right edge of the left rectangle is to the left of the left edge of the right rectangle, we can separate out these two objects. And so again, the right edge of the left rectangle is to the left of the left edge of the right rectangle. And so this is one of the four ways in which two rectangles can be separated. We've got two cases down here. In the first case, we just saw the red rectangle is completely to the left. There's our separating axis. In the second case, the red rectangle is completely to the right. There's our separating axis. In the third case, the red rectangle is below. There's our separating axis. In the fourth case, the red rectangle is above, and there's our separating axis. And it's possible when two rectangles are separated that it might fall into many cases at once. Right, there might be more than one separating axis. For example, if the red rectangle was to the left and above the blue rectangle, there could be two separating axes. But the important thing for our purposes is if two rectangles do not overlap, it must fall in one of these four cases. So let's head back to our Java code. We're gonna check to see if two rectangles overlap, by first determining if they do not overlap. And so I'm gonna declare a Boolean variable called no overlap. It's gonna be equal to a combination of these four different cases. So for example, in the first case, right, the left edge of this rectangle, sorry, the right edge of this rectangle is to the left of the left edge of the other rectangle. I think of the first red rectangle as this, and the second blue rectangle as other. And so there's kind of four cases, which I'll put together with some or statements. So let's put in a comment, then I'll help us. And so there's four cases to consider. So this is to the left. left of other rectangle, or this rectangle is to the right of other rectangle, or this rectangle is above 
other rectangle, or this rectangle is below the other rectangle. I mean, any one of those four cases will indicate that there's no overlap. So to determine if there's an overlap first, uh, this rectangle is to the left. If its right edge is less than to the left of the other rectangle's right edge, sorry, the other rectangle's left edge. Or, see for the second case, uh, this rectangle's is to the right of the other rectangle, meaning its left boundary is to the left of the other rectangle's right boundary. Kind of a nice symmetry to this. Actually, now if this rectangle is to the right of the other rectangle, sorry, got that backwards. The other rectangle is less than this rectangle's x. Excellent. Or the other cases, this rectangle is above the other rectangle. And so going back to our diagram here, that would be our case four. This rectangle, the red rectangle, is above the other one. If its bottom edge, the y coordinate, which is y plus h, is less than the top edge of the blue rectangle. <laughs> So the bottom edge, this dot y plus this dot h, the i, g, h, t, is less than the others y, or this rectangle is below the other rectangle. So other dot y plus other dot height is less than this dot y. Right, so if any one of these conditions is true, there is a separating axis, meaning there is no overlap. And so the two rectangles do overlap if it's not the case that they do not overlap. So what I want to return here is not no overlap. It's a double negative, but it's still logically sound. Hopefully that's okay. I've got my rectangle class, that's fantastic. Now I'm gonna create a sprite class to store a lot of this information. So I'm gonna create a new class, I'll call that sprite. So this will be a public class sprite. Now what information do we need for a sprite in a video game? Let's see, we need, uh, we can use a vector for its position. Uh, optionally, we can have a vector for its movement. So for its velocity. And so what else should we have? We should store an image. And we'll have to import a class for that. Let's see, then we have a public rectangle, call that boundary. And so that seems like some good information for our sprites. Right, I need to import a class here. Import from JavaFX. Let's see, I think this might be in, I'm not sure, I'll go ahead and check the API real quick. This is in the class, yep, scene image. JavaFX.scene.image.image. And while I'm importing things, let's also do JavaFX.scene.canvas.graphics context. I'm gonna need that when I render it later on. All right, so first I'm gonna go ahead and create my uh, public sprite. I need a constructor.
All right, so let's see. I'll initialize position to be a new vector. I'll set them to zero, zero by default. Uh, velocity is also a new vector. All right, to store a rectangle, right, the rectangle is always going to be changing as an object moves around. So let's see, maybe instead of storing a boundary, uh, this would be good if the boundary was static, but that might not be the case. So instead, uh, perhaps I'll delete this. And instead I'll say uh, public rectangle get boundary. In this case, I'll return a new rectangle at position dot x, position dot y, and actually I need width and height. So at the images width, I need to do get width, image dot get height. All right, this isn't the most efficient code there could be. Maybe we'll refactor this as we think about this. Because here we're initializing a new rectangle every time we get a boundary. Maybe we should have a rectangle and just update its data when we get the boundary. Yeah, maybe let's do that. Uh, public rectangle boundary in the sprite class. Let's say boundary equals new rectangle. Maybe down here we can say rectangle, we can set the width and the height to be uh, probably when, whenever we set the image be the best way to do this. So you and I need to initialize this to something. Um, for now, let's set it to zero, 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 zero. Kind of an empty rectangle until we set an image. All right, so this is a little bit stream of consciousness. That's okay. Uh, let's do a public void set image. And maybe here we'll just, uh, to make our future code simpler, Let's say string file name. Now we can say image equals a new image. And let's load whatever that file name is. And while we're here, let's get the width and height of the image and store that as the width and height of the rectangle. And so boundary dot width is equal to image dot get width and boundary dot height the image dot get height and down here in get boundary we can update uh, boundary dot x will be take that from our position vector boundary dot y and we'll take that from our position vector. Then we'll just return boundary. All right, that feels a little bit better. All right, so we've got Sprite. Uh, we can set an image just for simplicity. Uh, let's say set its velocity and position as well. So public void a set position, double X, double Y. See position dot X equals X. You know, as I write this code, I'm not enjoying writing this code. I'd much prefer to be able to just set X and Y. I do position dot set X, Y which means I need to write a set method in my vectors, which seems like a fine idea. Going back to the vector class, let's create a public void set, double X, double Y. Say this dot X equals X, 
this dot y equals y. As an added bonus, I can simplify the constructor in the vector class just a little bit, saying this dot set x, y. Okay, it's feeling a little bit better. Now in this code, <laughs> set position works fine. Thinking when we actually uh, write the game itself, we could also just do position dot set. It might be actually a little bit weirdly redundant to have this method here. I'm not sure if we'll use it, but we'll find out soon. All right, um, so we can get the boundary of an object. In general, we might wanna check if two sprites overlap by calling the overlap method on their rectangles. So to make our life easier on our future selves, uh, let's go ahead and create an overlaps method between two sprites. Again, it's just gonna delegate this and call the return method, or it's gonna return the result of calling the overlaps method on the boundary of this object and the other object. And so we'll get this boundary and check if it overlaps uh, the other sprites boundary. All right, that's pretty nice. Okay, so we've got a get boundary, we've got overlaps. Uh, the other thing we're really gonna need to do is we're gonna need to render this to whatever canvas we're using. And that's why we had the earlier import of the graphics context class. So I'm gonna create a public void render method. It's gonna take in a graphics context object it's gonna basically render itself with that information. So context.drawImage, uh, we're gonna draw at the position x, y, whatever that image is, or do I have that backwards? I do. Draw image, draw the image at position dot x and position dot y. Excellent. All right, so what I'd like to do now is head to our main game class. Right. At this point, I'd like to create a sprite and I'd like to try rendering it on the canvas. So I'm gonna create a sprite called turtle. It'll be a new sprite. A turtle I think I will, I'm gonna skip the set position method. Turtle.position.set, I'll put it somewhere a little bit down from the top left corner. Let's also say turtle.setImage. And in my images directory, I do have a file called turtle.png. And then turtle, I'd like to render to the canvas. So turtle.render using the context object. All right, if everything goes according to plan here, I should be able to run the game. I'll see my blue screen and I'll see a turtle swimming along in the middle of it. Not really swimming, should be static and just sticking around. Let's take a look at this. Yep, sure enough, I've got my turtle, excellent. Next, I'd like my turtle to move. And for this, I'm gonna to need to use the animation timer class. I'm gonna go ahead and set up uh, what I like to think of as a game loop. So I'll create an animation timer called game loop. And so I'm creating a new animation timer and there's a method I have to implement here. And so I need a public void handle. And this takes as a parameter a long for nanosecond time. I basically ignore that. And what I'd like to do is render the turtle within this loop. All 
right? And I also have to start the game loop. This tells me what is going to happen about 60 times per second. I'll say game loop dot start. All right. Uh, next, I'm going to go ahead and I want to start handling input now. Right, so in this case, uh, whenever we press an arrow key, what I'd like to do is I'd like to move the turtle in one of those directions. So I have to set up some kind of an event handler to listen for key presses. And the plan is I'll add those key presses to a list and then within the game loop, I'll check which keys have been pressed and then uh, according to the key, I'll add something to the turtle's velocity, and in turn, uh, the turtle will update its position based on that. All right, so let's try that. Okay, to store the names of the keys which have been pressed, I'd like to use a list, specifically an array list. So I'm going to head up uh, back to the top of the class, and I'm going to add a new import. I'm going to go ahead and import uh, java.util.arraylist. Then in the start method, uh, along with initializing a canvas and this sprite, I'm also going to initialize an array list of strings, because this will contain the names of the keys which have been pressed. I'll call this input list. So this will be a new array list of strings. Now, let's see, I've got a scene object called main scene. I have to say what happens when a certain key is pressed. So main scene dot set on key pressed. And I have to specify what's going to happen when a key is pressed. Uh, the way I usually like to do this is by using a lambda expression. It's a simple way to express some functionality. Right. So we're looking for key events. So when a key is pressed, first I'm going to figure out the name of the key that was pressed. So I'll create a string called key name. I'll get that from uh, the event. I'm going to get the code, which is a certain name. I'll convert that to a string. Uh, next, I'd like to add it to the input list, but I want to make sure that every key only gets added once. You might recall that sometimes if you just hold down a key, right, if you hold it down, you'll see it appear many times. I only want to add one instance of each key name to a list at a given time. So I'm going to say if it's not the case that the input list contains this key name, then I'm going to add it. Input list dot add key name. And I've got a list of all pressed keys. Similarly, I need to say what happens when a key is released. And so I'm actually going to copy and paste this code. And this new copy, I'm going to say set on key released. And again, this is a key event. Again, I'm going to get the name of the key. In this case, I'll just say input list dot remove key name. It's no longer being pressed. Okay, those will be our two events to monitor the input that we're receiving from the keyboard. Now we're going to process that input in the animation timer. And so before we render the turtle, I'd like to take a look at the different keys which could be pressed. So for example, if input list dot contains uh, the word left, because I've pressed the left arrow key, then what do we want to do to the turtle? 
I'd like to take the turtle and I'd like to give it some velocity, kind of have it move to the left at some rate. Now I want to think of this as adding velocity as well, because I would like to be able to handle combination key presses. For example, left and up should move the turtle on a diagonal, going towards both left and up at the same time. So it occurs to me that I'm going to need to add another method. Right? What I'd really like to do is say uh, turtle dot velocity dot add, and then say add since we're going to the left. This would be negative 50, zero. Right, this isn't going to compile yet because we haven't created an add method for vector objects. So we'll do that next because this will be a nice way to write this code. Heading back over to the vector class. I have a set method in the vector class. Next, we're going to add, <laughs> we're going to add an add method, public void add, uh, double dx, double dy, Code is this dot x plus equals dx, this dot y plus equals dy. Right. So this will just increment the x and y values by some amount. And so that's it for our addition to the vector class. Let's head back to the starfish collector class. All right, so in the animation timer class, now that code compiles. And I'm going to copy those two lines and create uh, three pastes of that code to handle all the different directional keys you could be pressing. For instance, if we're pressing to the right, we're going to add 50 pixels per second, say, to our velocity. If the input list contains up, see, then we're not adding any x velocity. Instead, we're adding y velocity. Really, we're subtracting from y. Let's see. And then going down means we're going to be increasing y. So I'll add 50 in that case. All right. That looks pretty good. Also, what if the input list contains none of these? Right, we should probably start out by setting the turtle's default velocity to zero, zero, in case none of those are pressed. And you might ask, well, you know, shouldn't you write an if and an else if? Well, in this case, again, if you're pressing, say, left and up at the same time, I do want to move it a diagonal. If you're pressing left and right, I actually would like those numbers to cancel each other out. So I'm actually not going to use else if in here at all. Excellent. So I've got the velocity. Next, uh, whatever the velocity is, I like to think of that as pixels per second. I'm going to add to the turtle's position. So turtle.position.add. What I'd really like to do And sometimes you think of the code you want to write and then you can write the methods to support it. I'd really like to take the position and add the turtle's velocity times uh, one over 60. Because this is the number of pixels per second we should be going at. But since this method is being called every 1 60th of a second, we need to scale it down by multiplying it by that constant. Right? And then I want to add the x and y values in the velocity vector to the x and y in the position vector. So in order for this line of code to compile, this indicates that I actually need to write two more functions in the vector class. One needs to handle multiplying by a scalar. And the other, I need to overload the add method to say, what if you want to add an entire vector rather than adding x and y as individual parameters. So let's head back to the vector class. So first we're going to overload the add method. Uh, public void add uh, vector, say other. 
in this case, uh, this dot add other dot x other dot y. And so again, this add calls this add function, but first retrieving the x and y from the other vector. Uh, next, we'll do multiplication. I suppose technically this is called scalar multiplication, but we'll just say multiplying by some number m. In this case, this dot x times equals m, this dot y times equals m. All right, so we're multiplying and adding vectors to a vector. Now, if we head back to the starfish collector class, that sounds pretty good. All right, so we figure out what the turtle's velocity should be. I feel like, again, to make this code a little bit nicer, I maybe I should say double speed equals 50, in case I want to change this value later. Be slightly nicer if it was written like this. All right. Hmm. Let's see, turtle velocity dot multiply. Oh, you want this method doesn't actually return anything. And so it's a void return function. I need to write it slightly differently. Uh, let's say, first multiply the turtle's velocity by a 60th of a second. And then we'll add uh, the turtle's velocity to its current position. Okay, everything seems to compile now. The code looks pretty nice. Now let's give this a try. Hopefully pressing the arrow keys will enable us to move the turtle around the screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and run the main method. All right, cool, the turtle moves left and right, up and down, and at diagonals. <laughs> One thing you might notice, Again, there's a little bit of a black residue there. That's because I'm not clearing the canvas after every update. So we should add that line of code in as well. Well, this does look neat. It's not the effect we're going for in this game. In the Starfish Collector class, and before we render the turtle, let's go ahead and clear the canvas. We'll do that by drawing a blue rectangle. So context dot set the fill color to be again a nice blue. Then context dot fill rect zero zero and the width of the canvas. Then we draw the turtle. Excellent. So we should have a nice moving turtle now. Let's go ahead and run to confirm. There, that looks really nice. Uh, next, I'd like to add some starfish to this game. Again, this is a collection style game and the goal is for the turtle to collect all the starfish. So let's close this, let's head back into our game. It wouldn't be fun just to collect a single starfish so we're gonna create a whole array of starfish objects. So let's create an array list of sprites this time. I'll call this the starfish list. It'll be a new array list of sprites. And we'll just add a bunch of starfish at random positions in the game. Let's say int uh, starfish count is equal to, eh, it doesn't really matter, let's do 20. All right, for int n equals zero, n less than starfish count, n plus plus. I would like to go ahead and, well, I'd like to create a new starfish sprite. 
And so let's see, sprite starfish equals new sprite. Let's come up with a random position for it. So double X is equal to, well, math.random gives us a random number from zero to one. I want this to appear somewhere on the screen. Uh, let's maybe say 400. So multiply by 400 and then add 100. All right, the screen, the X coordinates could range from zero to 600. This gives us a random number between zero to 400 and then shift it over by 100. This will give us a number in the range from 100 to 500. So kind of in the middle of the screen. Let's do the same thing. Get a random number Y. And starfish uh, position, we'll set that to the X and Y values there. And we'll also load the image. Starfish.set image to images slash starfish.png. Finally, we'll add it to the starfish list. This will greatly simplify when we want to render these objects later on. We can just iterate through the list of starfish and render each one to the screen. All right, so this initializes our list of starfish. Uh, let's go down to our game loop. Let's add in the part where we will render all these starfish to the screen. All right. So where should I draw the starfish? That's kind of important. I want to draw them after the canvas has been cleared. But for now, I'd like the turtle to appear on top of the starfish. So I'll draw the canvas first, uh, followed by the starfish. And here I'll use the for each uh, method style, sorry, the for each loop style, uh, for each sprite named starfish in the starfish list. I would like to render that starfish using the context. Starfish.render context. All right. Let's go ahead and Give this a try, see how this looks. Compile all the things. Excellent. We've got a bunch of randomly positioned starfish and a turtle that moves around. Very nice. Next, I'd like to say check for when this turtle overlaps a starfish. And if that happens, I'd like to remove the starfish from the game. So let's head back into the Starfish Collector class. This is where we'll use those overlap methods. And we'll do this before the renderings. This kind of falls within game logic. All right, so first we process some input. We move the turtle. All right, so after we've changed the turtle's position, Let's go through the list of starfish. Now, what I'd like to do, I'm going to show you what I'd like to do and then explain why I can't do it. Um, I want to check if turtle uh, overlaps starfish. I would like to say for every, just like I did before, that's a nice method. For every sprite starfish in the starfish list, I'd like to say um, if turtle dot overlaps starfish, then starfish dot remove. I should not starfish dot remove. Starfish list dot remove starfish. Now, unfortunately, this is a horrible idea because if we're iterating over a list and then we change the list as we're iterating over it, right, that messes up the counting. Oh, and this is lowercase starfish. 
right? So it compiles okay, but when we actually try to do this remove, we'll get an error called a concurrent modification exception. Right, so unfortunately we can't iterate over a list in this way and then remove things or in any way alter the objects in the list, meaning we're adding them to the list or removing from the list while we iterate over the list. So we have to do a more traditional for loop in this case. And it's a little bit longer, but this will be fine. So I'm going to say for int uh, n, I'll say int s equals zero, s less than starfish list dot size, s plus plus. And now I have to get my starfish from the starfish list kind of manually. And I'll try that same code. All right, that should work okay. If the turtle overlaps a starfish, then we're gonna go ahead and remove it from the list. Let's go ahead and compile. Let's run this game and let's see if that turtle can collect those starfish. Yep, sure enough, as soon as the turtle touches each one, it disappears and it's removed from the game. Fantastic. Now the last thing I'd like to do, right? once you've collected that last starfish, uh, what's next? Is the game really over? It's hard to tell. There's really no sense of closure here. So what I'd also like to do is draw some text, say in one of the corners, so that it says, for instance, how many starfish are left, and then once you collect them all, change that to some kind of a you win style message. Right, so let's go back here. All right, and we'll do this last. After drawing the turtle, what I'd like to do is draw a score slash uh, win message. Right, so first I'd like to figure out how many starfish are left. That'll be the size of the starfish list. And so I'll say int uh, starfish left is equal to starfish list dot size. And I'll say if the starfish left is greater than zero, then I'm going to draw something I'd like to draw some text and context dot, I'll do a couple of things here. No, I can do this pretty quick. Uh, context dot, I'd like to draw some stroke text and say starfish left plus actual the variable, however many starfish are left. I'd also like to draw some filled in text. Right, the difference is fill text, I'll actually do that first. Fill text draws filled in text and stroke text kind of draws a border around it, which is a nice touch. Starfish left. And as usual, as I'm writing this code, I realize there's a bunch of ways I can improve it. And so for instance, I'm printing exactly the same text twice. So let's go ahead and save that in a variable. And so, text and I have to say where it's going to be placed. So maybe I'll place this uh, just, let's try 100, 100, and then we might move it later. Same thing here. And I need a semicolon there. Okay, 
Also, I want to change the colors for the fill text and the stroke text. And so let's say context dot set the fill color. I'm gonna make it look like starfish. Uh, so I'll say the fill color is yellow. In context, uh, set the stroke color to be orange. All right, so if the starfish left is this, then I'll set this text. Um, otherwise, I'm going to have some different text here. Let's see, uh, if the starfish left is not greater than zero, then it must be equal to zero. So in this case, uh, the text is going to say something like, oh, I don't know, you win. That gives us that sense of closure. And then, you know, I probably wanna draw this at the same position. And so again, let's factor some code out here. And so really all I'm changing is the text. So let's declare a string called text outside of this if else statement. Yeah, we can definitely shorten this code up. All right. So what are we doing here? Again, uh, this is the message which is going to display in the top left corner of the screen. We figure out first how many starfish there are left. We're gonna draw a message in yellow and orange. Depending on uh, that text will depend on how many starfish are left. If it's greater than zero, we'll display the number of starfish that are actually left. Otherwise, the text we display will be you win. And then we'll go ahead and draw that, those pixel coordinates. All right, let's go ahead and compile this and give this a run. Except for the size of the font, I think this is gonna be pretty nice. Yep, <laughs> that is a teeny tiny font. In fact, it's so small, you can't even distinguish between the fill and the border. But we can still determine if the mechanics win. If, if the mechanics work here. So sure enough, once we collect them all, it does say you win. Very nice. Okay, the next thing we need to do is to set the size of the font. Uh, to set the font, I think it is as easy as saying context.setFont to be a new font object. I need to give the name of the font. Maybe I'll switch to a nice Arial, and then a font size, I like something which is nice and readable. It's maybe 36 point font. And let's see, this is pretty far over, so maybe I'll just say 25, 25, so it's not too far away from that corner. Maybe a little bit of experimentation as we find some good values for our text. So let's go ahead and give this a run, see if that looks any nicer. Oh, one thing we have to remember about drawing text is that instead of giving us the top left corner, uh, it's giving us the bottom left, kind of the baseline of the text. So I will need to increase the Y value a little bit for this to appear on the screen. Um, also, I might choose a slightly larger font and perhaps a thicker border so you can actually see that orange border a little bit more easily. All right, back to the code, we'll make a few more adjustments. Right, first, I'm gonna choose a different font. Uh, for this to work, the font does have to be installed on your system. But Arial Black is a pretty common font, so hopefully you'll find it all right. And I also want to increase the size of the border of the font. So I can say set line width. 
Uh, maybe I'll set that to something nice and thick like uh, four pixels. All right. And I also want to move the text down a little bit. Instead of 25, maybe I'll change that to 40. And let's give this a try and see how our game looks. Okay, first, <laughs> four is too much. Not even going to try playing that game. Set the line width to maybe two. Right, one more try. That yeah, looks pretty nice. I'll go ahead and move my turtle around. Collect some of those starfish. Why is the turtle collecting starfish? I don't know. But it does. We're successful. Congratulations. Uh, we've won the game. And that's an introduction to creating sprite-based games in JavaFX.